This is the Television Enthusiast Podcast, The Weekly Set. Episode 41, recorded January 28, 2016. Hello everybody and welcome to the Weekly Set Podcast. This is the official podcast for TVEnthusiast.com. I am your host, Tyson, and joining me today is Will. Hello. Today we're going to be talking about what we've been watching in the last couple of weeks. We're also going to be talking about our recent articles we put up of our best of 2015 pick and talk about, you know, some of our choices there and do a little bit of a wrap up of some of the kind of significant events in 2015 as they relate to TV. Uh, so I'm going to start things off. Uh, Will just watched the first two episodes of The Magicians. Now I'm actually ahead of him, uh, even though there's only two episodes that have publicly aired. Thanks to screeners, I'm a little bit ahead on there, so I'm going to hold back on any spoilers on that. Of course, I'm not going to give you guys any information on that, but uh, we're going to talk about the first two episodes. Um, so if you haven't seen those yet and you do want to and you're afraid of spoilers, then you want to skip a little bit ahead because that's what we're going to be talking about right here. So you saw the first two episodes of The Magicians. Well, uh, general thoughts? Amazing. This is this this is an awesome show. Um, characters are great. Um, the story is interesting. Um, you know, I, I like where it's going. Uh, the main villain when he shows up is absolutely terrifying. He, just, he makes quite the entrance and also like from just from a visual perspective it is something completely different that... Yeah, it's like something out of a Japanese survival horror game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see in Silent Hill or something. You yeah, know? it's something like out of Silent Hill or something. It's freaky. It's freaky as hell. And that and that's also like the best moment of like the first episode. And if nothing else sells you on the show Oh, that last moment will. Yeah. Uh, basically, it's best described as it's Harry Potter for adult. It, yeah, <laughs> that, that's kind of like the easy way to describe it. And it wears its Harry Potter influence on its sleeve. I actually did a, a, a conference call with uh, Sarah Gamble and uh, the main star of the show. Uh, Sarah Gamble, of course, had written for Supernatural before um, oh, she worked on this show. That's um, right. I, I, I recognized the name in the credits. I was, like, I was thinking she either worked on Buffy or Supernatural. Yeah, she worked on Supernatural, and um, uh, I, when talking to both of them, uh, yeah, they're talking about the Harry Potter influence is, like, they don't, they're not, like, diminishing it. They're like, yes, there is a huge Harry Potter influence there was on the book. The the author wrote the book because he was sick of waiting for the, the, there was a big gap between, I think it was between books four and five, and he was sick of waiting, so he just created his own series. (laughs) And so that's, that's, like, the origin of the series is directly related to Harry Potter. That is and awesome. there's you haven't really gotten into it yet, but there's like there's houses kind of like in Harry Potter, like how there's like Gryffindor and you know Ravenclaw in, in Harry Potter. So there's kind of houses dealing with like your specialty of magic. Oh, that's great! So I can't wait to be. I yeah, can't, you're... I can't wait to proclaim myself as house whatever and have nobody around me know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you're gonna you're gonna see uh, um, that kind of stuff. It's it's not as big of a deal as it is in Harry Potter the houses it's just kind of where you live right it's not like they don't have like you know you get points for your team and there's like you know Quidditch or (laughs) at least not yet you know I don't know there could very well be something that's season three yeah Quidditch (laughs) Um. (laughs) but yeah it definitely has that feeling um I kind of like the whole one of the big changes that they mentioned when I did the conference call with them was that in the original book it was like college um and in the show it's like grad school oh Okay. I really like that kind of grad school aspect. It really is different. Like when you get into the first season and they're like already out of college, they're very bright. They're like academic. They're, they're people that are involved heavily in academia. It's not like just a bunch of party kids or something. You know what right, I mean? Right, right. Yeah. They're very heavily involved in academia. Um, <laughs> I, li- I like that the protagonist is like this super awkward, socially inept, like nerd. And I, yeah. and I, and I like, like, I like uh, the second episode. Um, she says, you know, he, he's smart, 
smart but not a genius and he he could do magic but nothing special and i thought i thought you know that's perfect because if they if, if they wrote him as like this guy who's the awkward, chosen one. yeah like he's a chosen one or something like like oh he's awkward but he's like a super genius or something stupid i i like i like that he's more of an actual person it's also i like that he's an actual magician in like the non-magical way yeah yeah like, like he knows magic tricks and sleight of hand and stuff and that is like a boon to him as an actual magician now yeah that's a boon. like it's like it comes into play and it, it's really kind of cool and like you know just like seeing him doing stuff like he'd be in the classroom and he's like throwing a coin on his hand or you know what i mean like popping cards and stuff and you can just see him doing you know magician like things and it, it's like it's just kind of cool and it's it's something that like a lot of these people that are in the school that have kind of gone in more like probably knowing what magic is more or, or having been more aware of it in their lives um they don't like know this kind of stuff because it's it's not like they were pursuing magic in that way and then discovered real magic they had no interest yeah. in that. so it's just kind of interesting and um when we we're on the conference call he said that he actually ended up saving the show like seven thousand dollars because they were going to have to try to use like special effects or hand doubles and stuff to do like the sleight of hand stuff but the actor learned all the stuff he like studied really hard and learned how to do the magic tricks himself and uh, uh so yeah the the director of the pilot was like wow you just saved us like seven thousand dollars and he's like well then buy me a nice bottle of wine <laughs> yeah no it's like um no it's like it's amazing um what do, you, what do you think of Fillory, which is the the kind of Chronicles of Narnia esque story within a story? Kind of Chronicles of Narnia esque. <laughs> um, it's, it's a clock instead of a cupboard. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> I, I found that I found that aspect to be really fascinating. It adds a different different wrinkle to it because now it's not just about like this magic school. Like this magic school is like one thing that's happening, but then this Fillory stuff is something else that I think takes even more precedent and they're kind of hinting that like the school is kind of like a distraction for the main character mm -hmm. and that they're they're you know and uh and apparently this fillery place is where like this villain comes from too and so um i i, I found that like really that's really fascinating too and i'm interested to see them explore that more and to see where that goes because i think that adds like a really fascinating like wrinkle to it yeah and him having that having this kind of weird connection to it himself with uh like getting that mark on his arm and and um uh like having the dreams with the one girl from fillory and all that you know it's just it's really interesting it is it's super interesting um another thing i like i like that the characters aren't like um they're not they're not like all just stereotyped mm -hmm. like it seems like they are on the surface but then like they're actually written like as like real people you know in instead of like ah oh, it, it's just so good <laughs> i also like that magic is portrayed as something that's incredibly hazardous but not necessarily like you know like a lot of times when they portray magic as like a hazard they portray it as a hazard in that way like oh the second you use it you've sold your soul to a demon kind of thing you know right right and it's yeah. not like that it's not absolutist like that it's more just like it's an incredibly dangerous force of nature that you can't quite completely comprehend <laughs> right exactly or like and trying to wield it as yeah it's, it's like standing in a, like right in front of a hurricane you know <laughs> trying to survive <laughs> yeah exactly it's it's not easy to wield magic and also like magic isn't like a cure-all for everything either i like mm -hmm. that too it's it's not like the type of magic you see in shows where somebody gets hurt and they just wave their hands and they're better and it's like, <laughs> yeah it's like no that doesn't happen with this show <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely and you, and this, the show continues to go in that direction so you're, you're, you're not asking, to to. you know what what happens to one of the main characters at the end of the first episode you're, yeah. you're, you're not saying they're asking okay well why don't they just wait use their magic to fix it yeah and, <laughs> because it doesn't work that way and, and you know that innately just from watching the show it's and i i love that mm -hmm. and they dwell on the consequence of it too it's not just like an easy like okay well that was the first episode so you thought he was important but he's gone now or something it's like no he's still around but he's fuck <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and that plays a part you know and i really like that so that that's uh cool as well so there's a lot going 
on in the series. Um, man, I am so just enthralled with what sci-fi is doing right now as a network. Uh, the Magicians and The Expanse, oh, both of them so amazing. And this is quickly becoming like my favorite network again. <laughs> and yeah. it's like that it's been what since the days of, of uh, Battlestar and Stargate that, that this has been like one of my favorite networks, you know, and it's like right back up there again out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, this is, yeah, sci-fi is killing it right now. And it's like, this was a network that just a couple of years ago was just unabashedly airing garbage and they didn't care. And, you know, to see them bounce back in such a powerful way is, is satisfying to me as a fan of genre content, because, you know, everybody else has taken genre content and made it mainstream when it should have been the sci-fi channel from the beginning doing this since they were supposed to be the genre channel when they debuted um yeah it's it's definitely it's it's so satisfying to see them fulfilling their proper role again and science fiction as a whole has become so popular science fiction and fantasy um and it's cool seeing the sci-fi network not only competing in those fields but really excelling and excelling in a way that's like harder it, it's more for the harder fans of those genres right like they're not they're not doing a sci-fi that's like for Fringe, but are light or something like they're not doing like the kind of sci-fi we have on other things but you know that's about it like the expanse is super hard sci-fi you know it's like it's deep space there's like you know all this the hard science being put in place to explain things in a way that makes it feel very real and then you get into like the magicians and there's so much complexity going on in there that it's not it's not for the kind of people that are just going to tune into game of thrones because it's the it's the hot topic conversation you know it's for the harder fans of, of fantasy and you know yeah. so i really i really dig that they're that they're embracing that side of it whereas before they'd been kind of shying away from it and trying to go towards lighter science fiction this is of course before they just completely abandoned it and started airing nothing but reality b yeah, <laughs> yeah. um and changing, but yeah and changing their name too because yeah. Why not? <laughs> so yeah now now sci-fi is just killing it so very happy happy about that um great time to be covering tv because we're getting to the point where we like we don't have to talk about all of tv because you can't you can only talk about the things you love you have to narrow down your scope and that's making it amazing to cover so yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah happy to be doing this job this in this time you know with what's uh, going on. yeah it, 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 it's funny how uh how we have this site and the content out there is just so rich right now mm-hmm. um, and it just keeps getting better and better um, oh yeah, it's it's such an amazing time for television as a whole. Um, I, we're gonna go over that with, and at the towards the end of this podcast, when we're gonna be talking about um, certain events of 2015, I put together like a list of some of the shows that were really sad to see leaving. But then I also put some of the shows that are like amazing that debuted, and it's like the difference in the list is stunning. Like it's just ten times larger the number of new shows. It's crazy, and I like I had to narrow it down even further than I did the shows that were going away as far as like okay I I can't put all of them that's too many (laughs) so it's crazy how much new great content we're getting and it's of course it's it's really sad when we lose stuff like Hannibal you know which was like the best show on TV when it went off Um, but we're getting so many other good shows right now and even you know Brian Fuller made Hannibal's working on American Gods right now which is probably going to be amazing as well you know so it's just such a great time to be um a fan of television especially of like genre television yeah definitely uh such a great yeah um definitely so i i think it's safe to say that now i have a new favorite show the expanse definitely is also killing it um if if you if if you wanted a hard science fiction show uh the expanse has delivered in that aspect um for sure it's just great stuff Mm -hmm. um so next Next up, I'm going to be talking about Lucifer. Uh, now, you haven't watched this, Will, but but you know the premise because it's something we've laughed about quite often on this podcast. Right. Uh, this that, is <laughs> the premise 
quickly <laughs> summed up on Supernatural when Whisper <laughs> was talking to Sam and Sam said, "What? so what are you going to do once you beat the darkness? And he says, move to LA, solve crime. Yeah. That's what Lucifer is. So for those who don't know, Lucifer, it's this isn't just like some original take on, you know, Satan. This is um, based now very loosely, unfortunately, um, off of a comic book series, which itself was a spinoff of the famous Sandman comic book series by Neil Gaiman. Um, in Lucifer, in the comic book series, he moves to Los Angeles. He opens this kind of bar and he's just kind of doing his own thing there. And he's getting it, it's more like existential and philosophical and stuff. In this one, they said, OK, we'll have him do all that. And then a murder happens and he gets attached to a female cop and they start solving crime. Yeah, which they- is the most generic form formula that you see in play all over the place. And it's happened like five times this exact formula um, on network TV this year alone. It's, it's, it's like, it's like somebody said, Hey, why don't we take this great comic book and adapt it to TV? And NBC said, great idea, but can you make it a procedural? <laughs> oh no, this one's Fox. Oh yeah. Fox. I'm, <laughs> Fox is a great idea, but can you make it a procedural? Exactly. <laughs> and the, the thing that's so sickening about this is that this is not an unusual practice. This is done consistently. They did it with Minority Report. They said, okay, we have the rights to Minority Report. Let's do a Minority Report TV series. Okay, um, how about instead of a, a female precog, we'll, we'll follow a male precog, and he's out of the system. Okay, okay. And he teams up with a hot female police officer. Uh, okay. To solve crimes, and they'll have will-they-won't-they they chemistry. Right. <laughs> yeah. And this is the exact formula that's used in uh, uh, now in Minority report in uh, um, there's like a new Frankenstein series that's coming out that's like that. Second Chance, I, I think is what it's called. Yeah, they renamed uh, it Second Chance instead of the Frankenstein Code. Because yeah, I people... tried to distance a little bit from the, yeah, the yes. backlash of that. And then, yeah, somebody realized this really isn't Frankenstein at all. Yeah, it's just <laughs> so many shows that do that. You know, I mean, they did it back in the day. They did it with uh, um, uh, uh, with Sherlock. Not not like the British Sherlock, but they, they made elementary yeah, which elementary. is like CBS's version in which they gender swapped Wilson who's Watson. played by Lucy Liu you so that it could be a hot and made her a cop yeah so now she, it's a hot female cop so they can have will they won't they chemistry yeah because and it's oh god it's such a yeah, painful formula because we needed will they won't they chemistry between Sherlock Holmes and Watson yeah it's 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 so ridiculous it's so overdone but all of that being said Lucifer was a pretty delightful Delightful hour of television. Uh, the main character is great as Lucifer. He's not as good as as Mark and Supernatural. Um, mm-hmm. Very few are. He seems like <laughs> the role of Lucifer. Um, but I, from the previews, I really did not like his performance. I said, "Oh, he's so milk toast. It's just not going to work." Um, now, yeah. like actually watching the show, it, it's it's pretty fun. He's he's just one of the things I think I like about it is that it's not going like the small. Vote Arrowverse way of like secrecy and stuff. Like he's <laughs> basically just shouting out from the rooftop that he's Lucifer and he's immortal. Well, and yeah, he doesn't because, give a shit what anybody like it like about any repercussions to that. But, yeah, because who would believe him in the first place? And he's acting it out too. He's not just like doing that. Like he'll he'll just like walk towards somebody and slam them through a window and you know <laughs> show off that he's like crazy or like use his abilities to kind of get people to say things like right in front of every everybody else just without any concern just completely reckless to any consequence that would come of it which is that's probably the best thing about this show is that it's the complete antithesis of what we're seeing in like arrow and flash where they're like oh i care about her so i can't tell her my secret because that makes no sense at all um (laughs) that kind of like bullshit that gets so frustrating in in any kind of show where a character has like a secret right it's like no he might be lucifer but that's not a secret (laughs) And he has no need to keep it a secret. There's no, no there's no threat to him. Yeah, well, yeah, like, I mean, he feels no threat. He feels nothing. So it's like he has no concern. Yeah. Like a police officer will put him in handcuffs and he's just kind of smiling or something. And then he'll just take him off and leave when he feels like it. It's just like that kind of aspect of it is kind of great, you know? Um, so that's like the best thing I can say about it. I'd say this episode mm-hmm. came across fairly strong <laughs> until the end. And that's when you start going like, oh, now they're going to try to make make him more compassionate 
um, and more interesting as a character uh, so that you can better play this off and like having him like now he's going to like a therapist and <laughs> it's like oh uh, god like you can see the procedural element that was already in place in the first episode and was already the worst aspect of the first episode but you can see its ugly head rearing up to kind of take down the rest of what worked um, so I do not have high hopes for how this is going to continue but it was fun enough that I'm going to at least watch the next episode um, and probably be vastly disappointed and upset and quit watching it. <laughs> Which is, by the way, I didn't mention before, but th- that's what I ended up doing with uh, um, the, what was it, the uh, Shadow Hunter show, where I said I watched the first episode and thought it was, eh, it wasn't that great, but, you know, I was going to give it an art episode. Watch the second episode, I'm done. <laughs> okay, so it, it didn't improve with the second you know, it got worse, much worse. Uh, and, yeah, there was no hope. I, I didn't think there would be any hope for it. I was just watching more out of curiosity but wow it even disappointed me so even even having me watch purely out of morbid curiosity for what the show is going to be ended up disappointing um lucifer i imagine is going to take a very similar approach uh but un- unfortunately the pilot was pretty good and that's going to make it even more disappointing um when it inevitably fails to its trap end. right yeah yeah it, it doesn't look like a show i'm interested in starting unless I, I just say don't even bother unless, <laughs> unless, 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 unless it becomes amazing unless unless it becomes like the next Hannibal within the next few episodes <laughs> I'll tell you so. if it improves <laughs> okay. I doubt it I doubt it well and it, in, until that happens yeah I just steer clear because um, even though the pilot's good that almost makes it work because it's like you, you know it's not going to retain that you know and, and that makes it kind of a little depressing so um, speaking of depressing I watch I watched another new show this week. I watched Baskets, which is the new uh, Zach Galifianakis show. Now, I say, speaking of depressing, I don't mean the yeah. show's depressing like okay, it's Okay, I was like, you lead right in with speaking of depressing, and I'm like, really? I, but it's a depressing comedy, in okay. the same way that, like, Louie is. Um, it's it's a very, like, sad show, and that's where the humor comes Zach from. Zach Galifianakis seems like seems like he's primed to do, like, a depressing comedy. Yeah. So, this, yeah. Is, this is produced by Louis C. K. and it feels like it. Um, if, if you've ever watched Louis, Louis is like that. Louis is like a comedy in which like a character will kill himself and then everybody has to dwell on that and it's sad and you know it's like wait this is a comedy you know that and that's what like was so good about Louis and Baskets is like that as well. Now the one kind of concern I have is that like the premise is wearing thin by the end of the first episode so I don't know how they're going to keep that up. Oh really? I, I saw a scene from the second episode that was pretty funny so um, I think it might have some ground to move but it almost feels like it's better suited as like a short film like this is the tragedy of the clown and it's kind of funny and kind of tragic and you know and then you watch it and it's over and it's done you know having this go over the length of a series like I just don't know how that's going to work but unlike Lucifer I have some hopes that it could because this is produced by Louis C.K. and it's Zach Galifianakis and I've already seen scene like i said a clip from the second episode that looks pretty good so uh it's just it's interesting to watch because i i have no idea what they can do to carry this format this formula on you know it's like they it feels like they've covered or like they've touched every base in the first episode you know <laughs> right so it's like are they just going to keep repeating that formula like over and over again every episode are they going to take it in new directions are they going to find a, a new way of approaching that um those subjects that um takes you by surprise uh i have no idea uh but yeah i mean it was good it's just i have no idea how they're going to continue it you know that just happens sometimes it shows interesting interesting we'll have to see well definitely have to see what happens with that yeah i mean it's good this is a cable show because if that was a pilot the network would have been like uh okay (laughs) (laughs) what next and it would have never gotten picked up so um yeah uh I'm going to have to see where this goes. But that kind of that brings uh, our discussion of what we've been watching this week to a close. Now we're going to be talking about our feature conversation
recommendation of the week, which is um, the best of 2015. Now we've put up over the last month, we've put up four articles, uh, one from me, one from Will, one from Ed, and one from Kat, uh, who, by the way, just on a quick note, has uh, um, left Enthusiast Media Network. So you're not going to hear her on the podcast anymore because she has left. Uh, I don't really know that many details on it. Um, so I don't really understand that the full consequences of why she chose to leave. But uh, I mean, it seems mostly amicable right now, as far as I know. So uh, if uh, I hear more about that, that's relevant. I'll bring it up. But for right now, uh, we're just going to be having to move on. With her. Definitely going to miss having her on the podcast and wish her the best. Yeah. Ditto. Yeah. Same. Uh, so uh, best of TV of 2015. So first off, one of the things I decided to do when we were doing this list is that we had this huge list of categories. We're not going to be going over every category, by the way, but of this huge list of categories, I said, I want everybody to make their unique category for something that they want to address in uh, 2015. Um, and so we're going to go over those picks, uh, all of our picks. So uh, first up, Will, you had your list last. Um, yes. Just came out uh, yesterday. Uh, so uh, as the time of recording it, so Wednesday, um, your special category was that's not how science work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and your winner was the flash. So uh, explain your pick here. <laughs> okay. So I was thinking of special. One of the things that, uh, that grossly stood out to me and I realized despite how much I love the superhero shows on TV, um, shield arrow flash. I realized none of my picks involved those shows um, for very good reasons. I thought I just, those shows are good genre shows, but they, they don't have anything in them to qualify for a list like this, at least not currently. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to at least acknowledge that. And the only way I could do so is through the special category because of the Flash did something this year that Okay, so The Flash always kind of stretches the credibility, you know, your, your credibility when it comes to, like, the science stuff on the show. Um, there's always something goofy going on that's, like, the pseudo-science, and you kind of accept it for the sake of the story. But it did something in, an, in, a, in the Christmas episode this year that was pretty gross and uh, completely shattered any suspension of disbelief. And that was was when when he was fighting the trickster and weather wizard and trickster set bombs all over the city and all these yeah. random presents and, and all these random Christmas presents trees. and it became clear it was going to be impossible for the flash even with his speed to find them all in time and stop them and so as you're wondering well how are they going to get around this they pull some bullshit deus ex machina and just solve it in five seconds because because they figure out oh if we reverse the polarity of one of the bombs then it'll attract all the bombs to them and then we could throw them into earth too because that helped um <laughs> let's just blow up earth too why not um <laughs> so yeah it was, it was spectacularly stupid it was spectacularly <laughs> stupid i would my jaw was on the floor at that i was like really which was unfortunate because mark hamill finally nailed his modern version of the trickster uh um, yeah. in this episode and then it was just uh Ugh, that ending was so groan worthy. That, yeah, that ending was so groan. There was a lot to love about that episode, especially Mark Hamill, because Mark Hamill as the trickster is always such a delight. Um, and be, you know, I mean, but that was the role that he did on the '90s show, The Flash, and that was also the role that he used later on to inform his portrayal of the Joker, which is his se second most famous portrayal next to Luke Skywalker. Mm. <laughs> and, so, and so, seeing Mark. Hamill in this role is great. I mean, I loved it. I loved, uh, but that that ending, boy, that was just that was just the epitome of lazy writing. Yeah, it was it was very bad. Yeah. Um, uh, when 
when I had I, I had originally brought this up as being such a bad uh, point when we did uh, one of our uh, comic book casts, and Kat had reminded me that I had completely forgotten that Fra- Flash had earlier, I believe this year as well, done an episode in which uh, um, uh, uh, Captain Cold froze lasers yes. <laughs> and broke them as a way of getting past uh, laser line security. That that yeah, I, yeah, I remember that too. That was. <laughs> <laughs> Still not as bad as this. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's uh, um, <laughs> it is it's kind of shameful that they do that. I wonder if they're I, like if they laugh to themselves when they're doing this. I mean, they're like, a, oh my god, this is so stupid. I can't wait to see people overreacting on forums about it. Or, <laughs> right. I mean, that, and that's just a specific example I gave for the award. But you can actually you can actually take the the award as a whole to mean like all to apply to all the stupid stuff that happened on the flash this year because yeah. you don't have to apply it to just that but <laughs> that's just a specific example that's just a specific example that's the grossest example but yeah special category that's not how science works the flash enter example of what happens on flash there's a hundred of them <laughs> <laughs> So our next pick was from Kat, and she picked a favorite inheritor to John Stewart, which she gave to John Oliver. Now, the reason this is a category, because of course, you know, oh, well, the show moves on, so she's just picking whoever came next. Uh, no, as John Stewart's show was being canceled, John Oliver moved from The Daily Show over to HBO for a new show, and then uh, John Stewart's replacement, Trevor Noah, is the one who took over The Daily Show. Um, a lot of people have been dissatisfied with with Trevor Noah. I honestly, I don't think he's that bad. I think it's just that people love Stuart so much that it's hard to come down from, like they have to get used to a new person style and stuff. But that's you know, it's, it's just people have not grown attached to him. On the other hand, it seems like all the Daily Show fans have completely fallen head, head over heels for John Oliver uh, and his new show on HBO uh, last week tonight, uh, which is just involves him doing very long <laughs> Uh, takes on topics that are really fun to watch. So um, I know you were a fan of some of the John Oliver stuff because they've been putting up a lot of that stuff on YouTube. Too, up, I cool. am a yeah. huge John Oliver fan. I was a big Daily Show fan with Stop John Stewart. I remember John Oliver from when he was on that show. Uh, I did check out the clips of last week tonight, and they're on point. Like 100. I, I actually like John Oliver better than John Stewart. Um, I, I'd actually say so too. Yeah, I mean, he, he's funny, he's sharp, he's on point. I mean, you can't really ask for much better than that. She mentioned Stephen Colbert, and I'm like, I don't ever think Stephen Colbert was meant to be a successor to John Stewart. Stephen Colbert has come into his own as, as his own thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Stephen and, Colbert is always a, kind of a different, yeah, it's always you know, a different animal. <laughs> a completely different animal um and 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 i would say that we haven't gotten a decent inheritor to stephen colbert Um, no we have not (laughs) um in all fairness i have not seen the daily show since trevor noah took over so i've not seen trevor noah um so i can't judge him but i would have to agree with kat's assessment here that john oliver definitely is is the best successor to john stewart yes i i definitely agree and like you, I actually like him more than Jon Stewart. So uh, next up, Ed, his pick was the best documentary series. Uh, and he picked Making a Murder on Netflix. Now, this is a show that I have not watched, but I've heard so much about. It's become such a huge hot button issue. Um, people are just talking about it constantly. And it's something I want to get on. I just haven't had the chance yet. Um, are, are you pretty much in the same boat as me? I'm pretty much in the same boat as you. I haven't watched it. I don't know if if I want to watch it, I read I read what it's about, and it it's kind of a rough story. And knowing that it's true, I just yeah. don't I just don't know. I'm like, uh, I just it, <laughs> it, it, it's tough for me. Um, 
So. If you want a good fictional story that's kind of like this, I highly recommend the series Rectify, which is about somebody who might or not might not have been wrongly convicted of a crime. It's not like a fictionalized version of this same story. It's like it's just another case of somebody who it turns out probably wasn't responsible for a crime. After that, there's like no real similarity, but uh, yeah. it's similar in the way that you get into the idea of, of like just the way the justice system failed and, and kind of the emotions that happen when somebody leaves prison after a long time and the way people react to him on the outside, wh- whether that's positively as in like, you know, he was a victim or negatively as in uh, I, don't, I still don't trust him kind of, you know, Uh and so it's a really good show that follows on that side of it. That's about the only thing I can relate to this because I have not seen the show. It's interesting how many shows are taking this approach now, though, because it started all with uh, there was a podcast called Serial uh, that was made by uh, um, it's by the, the same people who do uh, This American Life, which is a real probably the most famous podcaster. Um, and it was a story about a crime and, and if the person was guilty or not. And they never really addressed the answer to it but it was just became a huge sensation very quickly after that hbo had a show called the jink which was a documentary series about like this very wealthy person who basically like everyone's known for so long that he's committed all these atro- atrocious crimes and has g- completely gotten away with it and um, because of his wealth and power and this kind of exposed him and actually led to him getting arrested uh, in real life like after the show came out so and then the success of that and that you know Netflix had making a murder might, might think like Netflix is kind of copying what was hitting but this is like documentary footage that goes back like over five years and making a murder. So this is something that's been cooking for a really long time. Um, You know, long before it was ever going to be at Netflix. You know, (laughs) long before Netflix was interested in original content. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting to see this kind of trend of shows. Like, everyone's going to have their, like, true crime documentary series now (laughs) that's supposed to, like, reveal things that nobody knew, you know, and get people out of jail or, you know, you know, cause huge debates about our justice system. So who knows where that's going to go. But um, I've heard great things about Making a Murder in particular. I want to check it out. Haven't had a chance yet, but that was Ed's pick. Nice. My pick for my special category, I picked Best Anime. Uh, I just wanted to pick... We, we don't talk about anime much on TV Enthusiasts. We do not have an anime enthusiast. Um, we've done segments here and there, but we never really get that much of an opportunity to talk about anime. And I wanted to pick what I thought was the best one of 2015, which for me was Gate, thus the JSDV or JSDF fought there. Uh, this is a series... It's kind of close to a genre that I've been become really attached to with light novels and manga and anime recently that if anybody's watching a lot of anime and manga and everything now there's there's a genre that you're going to be noticing a lot of that you've probably already noticed a lot of in which the main character is uh resurrect like dies or uh, and is resurrected in a fantasy world or transported to a fantasy world and they use their knowledge of the real world to you know excel within the fantasy world and a lot of times there's kind of game-like RPG-like elements in the story. Like, it's almost like all the characters are NPCs except the main character or something. Um, So they've done that kind of stuff. This one's a little bit different. So this series is about a portal that opens up in Earth, uh, in Japan, and an army, like a a fantasy army, basically, knight and dragons and all sorts of mystical creatures and stuff comes storming through and just slaughters like a whole bunch of people in Japan, takes a bunch more prisoners, and then they leave and a few of them get caught because forces are dispatched later but the reason the attack was successful because it happened in the middle of a civilian area there wasn't no there was no military there or anything you know um so it took a while for the military to um get to it and then by the time they did most of them gotten away so they captured some of the soldiers that invaded and that was it um then like earth or you know japan being the representative doing it because they they hold domain over the territory in which this portal is still standing. It's not something that's like disappeared. Uh, decides that they're going to start sending people through the gate to basically make sure this never happens again. And it's not like a, we're going to destroy this other world or whatever, but we're going to go through and we're going to work out a truce, a truce 
speedy uh, a treaty for peace with uh, the, the the country or nation or force that did this and eliminate any threats we find that are going to be something that are hazardous to us as well as just taking the opportunity of you know getting precious resources and you know establishing trade channels and any other kind of benefits that could come from establishing contact with like another world uh, so that's what it's basically about and what's really interesting about it is like the cockiness and the arrogance of these uh, um, fantasy side that came through this portal and attacked Earth just being completely shattered because you know hey dragons and you know knights on horseback are cool and all but they don't really stand up against like tanks and missile launchers <laughs> and mm-hmm. helicopters and fighter jets you know like our modern technology for military is like kind of scary when you really think about it and if you think about the idea of like like what would happen if like our army came in contact with like you know characters in game of thrones it's like yeah the characters in game of thrones and stuff are ruthless but they're so far behind like any they wouldn't it would be a slaughter, you know? Right, yeah, it would be a sl- Yeah, exactly. And and that's kind of what this is about. It's about kind of making these people realize the position that they're in and kind of the stripping away the arrogance and kind of the way that they meet up with these. Are, it's just, it's really interesting series to watch from that perspective. I believe the, the author of the original light, night, light novel series um, was in the JSDF, which stands for the Japanese Self-Defense Force, which Japan is not allowed to have an army. Uh, that's like after World War II, that was part of their treaty, but they are allowed to have a self-defense force, which is, you know, I guess <laughs> there's limitations. Uh, it's kind of like a National Guard almost um, versus having like a real military, a real powerful military, um, but it's still something and that's what's kind of the focus of it. But it gets into like political intrigue as well because there's, you know, other countries like China and the United States are, they want to be the ones going into this portal too. So there's like kind of politics going on on earth as well the whole time this is going on so it's a pretty it's a pretty good series and nice. it's it it aired its first season in 2015 and it's back on right now it's airing uh its second season right now so certainly sounds interesting yeah i i really like it it's it's a uh, my favorite anime of 2015 um so moving on from the special categories we're going to talk about our best uh drama or no let's go comedy first so these are uh, our picks that the four of us made for best comedy uh i'll start with ed ed had master of none on netflix this is a show have you watched the whole season i have not uh, you've watched a couple episodes though, right? i watched a couple like two or three yeah i think yeah. i think i've watched about half the season so okay. uh yeah i think we all liked it i think ed really liked it um ed had a couple of picks from uh master of none uh on his i list. don't think even if i watched the whole season it would have made my best comedy mm-hmm. uh, just, if you look at my pick uh that's more my style of humor but i did mm-hmm. i did appreciate master of none from what yeah, i saw it's it. definitely a new kind of comedy which is nice right um uh a lot of people have compared it to like woody allen um and the way it's put together um and people have said i've heard some people say that it's kind of <laughs> like louis but like less cynical <laughs> like yeah. more optimistic attitude uh so yeah uh i'm happy to see more stuff with Aziz and Zari. I really like him. I like him in Parks and Recreation. What's I, I, I think we've had enough cynicism on TV. Yeah. So, so it's nice to see programming that gets away from that. I think yeah. that, that just gets old fast. We've had a few good comedies that have kind of gotten away from cynicism. Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt's another one. Um, yeah, so it's, but Master of None is Ed's pick. Uh, we all like it as well. Uh, to varying degree. So yeah, that's uh, Ed's pick. Kat and I had the same pick, uh, which was Parks and Recreation. This was its final season. Uh, I think it was its best season. I think they really pulled out all the stops and did an amazing job of ending the series. And I think a big part of what they did that was so cool was they did a time skip at the end of the last season. So this whole season takes place just a little bit into the future, like a few years into the future. But they've they played on that. Like they make like these pop pop cultural references to like sequels of movies that never are going to happen (laughs) but like are like oh they happened in this world you know because 
better in the future and it happened or um, the way certain technology advancements have happened and stuff and the way that plays into the storytelling um, for the season makes it like a little bit more cartoonish in a way that I think really worked um, so yeah I really loved it I really um, there was like it was, it was a little depressing at first in the season because there was like a, a big strife between two of the main characters but that was settled in a way that was really good and addressed a lot of things that happened from seasons past and really like made it more touching when you get to the end of the series so yeah it was a very good season parks and recreation is a very good show i think all of it's up on netflix right now for anybody who's interested in watching it the last season i think just finally it but yeah uh did you ever watch parks and recreation i like it i i watched the first season okay that's its weakest yeah <laughs> parks and recreation is, a, is one of those shows that took a while for them to find their characters voices and really kind of find what they were trying to do so um season one of parks park and recreation was pretty weak uh and then it just kept getting stronger and like i said the last season is the strongest of it right definitely that's some, something for your uh, uh for your shameless stuff that you you need to watch if you ever have enough time okay. if you get stuck in a time loop where time just keeps repeating every day and you just have to <laughs> got nothing to do so you're just gonna watch like shows and just watch <laughs> that every day Parks and recreation will be one of those you can watch so <laughs> if you're ever in groundhog stay sounds good to me for your couple thousandth uh, uh repeats you can watch uh, some parts mm-hmm. of recreation. watch some parts of recreation yeah oh yes uh um, your pick for best comedy, Will. Uh, well, say it yourself. What was your pick? A uh, Man Seeking Woman. Uh, so this is a show that you didn't watch until 2016, but was a show from 2015. It, yeah, it's a show for 2015, so it counts in the 2015. Yes. It, it counts. Yeah. Oh, definitely. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. but yeah, I didn't discover it until 2015. I mean, I heard about it before, but then people were saying, you know, instead of being like this straight, uh, instead of being like a straight look at like relationships or something like people saying like oh it's this surrealist thing and i'm like oh, i don't know if i care for that too much um but i didn't realize at the time how that was going to play out or how i i didn't realize what they were going for and uh it's fair because it's hard to describe it really is um yeah. but basically this is a show about dating. Um, it's a comedy about dating, and but it is so much more. Um, it 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 definitely is like it's absurdist humor too. It's to the nth degree. So like, so you'll take like a typical situation, like say a blind date, um, where where the situation would be, you know, the the protagonist is set up and they're nervous about how their date is gonna look. Is she gonna be ugly? Um, are you gonna be, you know, all those, all those fears, and then you get this episode, he's set up with a troll, and literally, not, yeah, <laughs> like a literal, actual troll. And the conceit goes even further because it's not like it's not like he is perceiving his date to be a troll, like, this isn't in his head, this is an actual troll. Um, and even his sister who set him up knows it's a troll, and, and everyone in the restaurant where they're having. Yeah, yeah, and and they're acting like it's totally normal, you know. Um, so and then he and, has to feel like a jerk for. <laughs> he has to feel like a jerk. Um, so that that that's where the show goes, and it just gets more and more absurd as it goes along to like absolutely hilarious result. Um, like the stuff they come like in beings and. <laughs> it, it, I mean, you go. It goes from dating a troll to altering the space time continuum so that alien overlords take over and enslave the earth. Um, <laughs> so that's the show in a nutshell. Um, and and even with all this fantastic stuff going on, it still has this really honest hu- human core to it, which is, you know, it, it portrays the struggles of being single and, and, you know, jumping into the dating game in like a really honest way. And the main character isn't some insufferable douchebag. He is this genuinely likable person that happens to be, you know, that happens to be a little awkward and inept 
you know, he, he's not a ladies man, but, but he's not somebody like you hate. Like he's not somebody who's like so inept that you want to strangle him. <laughs> you, you're, you, you, he, he is very likable and you end up rooting for him. Um, and yeah, and that is a very fine line to crawl, you know, to walk really. I mean, I don't know if you saw uh, Stephen Merchant's uh, show on HBO, uh, Hello Ladies. Yes. You didn't like that? I liked it. I liked it. But the difference here between him and Stephen Merchant's is Stephen Merchant's character literally did things and acted in a way where you wanted to just smack him. Yeah. <laughs> because, because he was being a douchebag. Yeah. Uh, Jay Baruchel in this character is never, you know, never comes across as an outright douchebag. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's the difference here. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely agree with that. Uh, yeah. It was a really funny show. So, uh, of course, it's facing the problem that a lot of you know shows face when they're on like a channel like FX which is that if you do not have FX or if you happen to have like in Will's case Time Warner Cable <laughs> uh, it can be hard to watch the show because you need like some authentication which doesn't work with your cable provider or to, to watch like certain episodes so Will was able to watch season one because he has Hulu and that uh, um, it just came out on Hulu recently which is why Will saw it late uh but he can't watch season two because it requires authentication of his cable service and his cable service doesn't allow that authentication so (laughs) it's just one of these messes of of the old way of tv holding back the new way um but yeah that's you can catch the first season on hulu and it's good it, it is good. Highly recommended. Um, uh, unless you don't like absurd humor, <laughs> then 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 maybe then maybe you'll be put off by it. Who knows? Yeah, if you want your if you want your comedy really grounded, um, it might not be for you. Uh, next up, we have best drama. Uh, I picked Hannibal, which we'll get to later because that ended up coming spoilers in best show as well. So I'll we'll save <laughs> that to later. Uh, Ed picked Daredevil, which is amazing that was you know the first show in marvel's deal with netflix which is like ever expanding now that they might have punisher as well and (laughs) multiple seasons where we originally just thought it was going to be like this one-off season for all these different shows and then this one-off season for this like joint show and now like all these shows have multiple seasons and there's more shows being brought in so it's just this ever massively expanding mcu on netflix thing yeah Uh, but daredevil kicked it off um and and yeah, it's very good. Uh, I think almost all of us agree the second episode is where it really took off at the very end with the fight scene in the hallway. Um, yeah. Uh, do, you, do you have anything else to say about Daredevil? Uh, no, it's Daredevil's great. Yeah, so uh, you can check that out on Netflix. Cat's uh, pick was Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, which is a show that uh, has been getting better season by season. So uh, the first season of Agents Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., at least the beginning of the first season, was kind of painful to get through. <laughs> uh, the second season was a, a marked improvement um, overall. I still don't think the second season was as good as the second half of the first season. I don't. Where it's where I think it really took off because it's so deeply tied into what was happening on um, Captain America Winter Soldier, uh, which made it so good. But uh, second season was definitely a lot better overall as a season, though. Yeah. Uh, season three has continued to be just very strong yeah, um, yeah. so yeah it, it's it's kind of it's interesting to like tell people about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. because there's a lot of people that started it and then went like oh this is crap and it's like no no it's good trust me it gets better <laughs> um, very it went it's very hard and you know a lot of shows commit this sin, and you know it is very hard to convince somebody to stick with something it gets better a lot of people you know just don't have the patience and I really wish Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. had committed this particular sin because you're going to have a hard time getting new converts with that first season. Uh, 
it's yeah, a, yeah it's it's a shame really, but it do, it does dramatically improve. Uh, third season is the best that the show has been so far. So uh, um. Uh, uh, let's see. Will's pick for best drama was another Marvel show. So we have three Marvel shows in our best drama picks here. <laughs> Will, t- tell us about your pick. Marvel, we know drama. <laughs> I pick, my pick was Jessica Jones, and and why I picked Jessica Jones was because unlike unlike anything else Marvel has out there, this is in a way more grounded. Fair. It's more. It's it's more of a character study, and it's more it's more internal. It's focused on. One character, uh, Jessica Jones, and it's less about superheroics or saving the day as it as it is. It's about her and her struggles, her personal demons, and the demons that haunt her internal. Well, it's a very personal story, story. Yeah, it's a very personal story. So she literally had this traumatic experience because of this guy Kilgrave, and it has made her a very damaged person. Um, and she still hasn't got over it. She still hasn't gotten over it or fully healed from it when he turns up back in her life and she's forced to deal with it head on once more. Um, and that is the core of the show and I think that's very interesting from a dramatic standpoint mm-hmm. um, and so I th- I just thought this is a prime candidate for the best drama because it is something very different from the usual Marvel fair that oh, you yeah. see. Yeah and it's, it's interesting because uh, Daredevil and Jessica Jones were both so good I think Daredevil was probably better executed but yeah. Jessica Jones had a lot more to say I agree with more that. ambitious there was there was it was more like uh it was it was just much more personal it was more real it was it was it was a much more emotional journey um for Jessica Jones than it was for Daredevil uh so yeah uh i i liked it better than Daredevil uh i think ed prefers Daredevil cuz that's what he picked uh but yeah that's it's it's great show marvel killing it on tv uh i, I remember when agents of shield was kind of first on and we were talking about how like Oh yeah, DC is killing it on TV, and Mar- Marvel's like struggling from behind. <laughs> and now I feel it's kind of quite the opposite. It's quite the yeah, Marvel stepped their game up big time. Yeah, big time, yeah. especially with their Netflix series. Um, but yeah, it's been really good. So we're gonna move on now to best show. Uh, I'll start with Ed. Ed picked Fargo season two. So how much have you seen of season two of Fargo? Just the first two episodes. I really felt like I wasn't qualified to comment on Fargo for. The- this so Mm -hmm. that's why none of my nominations involve it because i just simply did not get around to watching it so i could not in good conscience um nominate it for any categories but i i wish i did because i know i know that it would have it it would have won some of my categories had i watched it yes uh fargo won several of mine it won uh for me it won best ensemble cast and uh can't remember I thought there was another one. Uh, I know for Will, uh, he also gave uh, for Best Showrunner. Um, and I think he did for Best Ensemble Cast, like I did as well. And might have been like Best Protagonist, or I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's very good. Season two of Fargo, which it, it's kind of an anthology series. It's connected to the other season, but it you could watch them in any order. It doesn't matter. <laughs> like you could watch either season first. Chronologically, se- second season comes first anyways. Um, it is is so good and I enjoyed it more than the first season uh, it's just yeah it, it's like a big mashup of everything we love about the Coen Brothers movies <laughs> like just nailed down in this like show and it just the way it handles the 70s like the era of the 70s and yeah, it's just so good so uh, yeah Ed made a great pick that was one that was struggling but it couldn't quite get past the one that I ended up picking for mine uh, but yeah great pick for best show. Kat's pick was The 100, which like Man Seeking Woman for Will is something that Kat just recently got into. Um, And then you know, it happened that last year 2015 for The 100 was the show's second season which was like a huge step up from the first season. Uh, The 100 is a lot like, we've talked about this on the podcast before, it's it's a lot like, like Game of Thrones in the way that like nobody's safe, you know, like characters that you'd love and 
think are like total safe bet, they could just die, you know? And uh, characters have to make really hard choices that carry big consequence with them. Uh, it's a show that I think a lot of people expected nothing out of uh, when it was first announced and the trailers came out for it. It just looked like, you know, pretty wayfish kids like in a Lord of the Flies kind of situation, you know, done badly or something. But the 100 is one of the examples of why the CW is just killing it for genre content right now. And it might be the best show on the CW right now. Um, so, yeah, it's been killing it. It's in its third season right now, which is also doing good. Um, Will, you have not watched the 100, but this is something that's on your list, right? The one, Yeah, it's on my list. It's on my list of stuff to watch. For yeah. sure. So the first two seasons are on Netflix now. So, yeah, that is uh, our cat's pick for uh, best show overall. Now, Will and I had the best or the same pick for best show overall, which was Hannibal. And so mm-hmm. we kind of skipped over it when I said my pick for drama because I knew it was going to be coming up here. So Hannibal, it's third season. I still don't think that third season was as good as its second. No. I think there was a weird, like the kind of separation between the Dollar Hyde story and the and Hannibal story at the beginning. Yeah, they tried um, to they tried they tried to do what become popular now, which is split seasons into two different stories. Mm-hmm. Which I think for Hannibal, um, it became like kind of a desperation move because they they literally ran out of time. Well, it's also because material. Hannibal, yeah, it's also because Hannibal is so heavily like his story I mean it's named after him you know is so integral that when he kind of takes a back seat for most of he actually comes towards the end of the season becomes more important again but through the beginning of Dollar Hyde's story Hannibal's his role is diminished and because you're not having so much put into the Hannibal will dynamic which is Hannibal uh, it's not it just doesn't work as well that being said the first half of the season, the stuff that was very Will and Hannibal focused, was stunning. I mean, absolutely gorgeous, amazingly shot. I mean, they filmed in Florence for a lot of it. Uh, oh, geez. And just like the artistry of what they were able to do. I mean, the sexually suggestive, kaleidoscopic lesbian sex scene, you know? Yeah. It's just yeah. amazing. It's like, this is the kind of stuff that you'd never see on, you know, network TV. And this is network TV. Mm-hmm. I and mean, this is stuff that it's like would be pushing the envelope for HBO and it's on network TV. It's like, yeah, it's amazing. And uh, even, even at its weakest, Hannibal is easily still the, the best thing on television. And that um, finale. Oh man. Uh, that finale was just amazing. Um, I, I have the best scene of that finale nominated for best fight. I mean, I'm going to say like a lot of my nominations are from Hannibal and that's partly just because two reasons how good that show was and also because uh, the stuff I watched, like, I I didn't watch as much a variety of stuff as I had hoped. And I, I am kind of embarrassed by how how many nominations on my list are from Hannibal. And I'm like, oh, just okay. I'll leave yourself in this one. I watched a huge variety of shows <laughs> this year. And Hannibal was a lot of my picks as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, don't don't worry. In, in the places where you picked Hannibal over other things, I feel they were safe picks. And honestly... Honestly, like when I was going over some of your picks, the ones that I might like argue against were the ones I would pick over Hannibal were other shows you did watch. So it didn't get in the way of it. Like, uh, you know, Best Fight, I picked something from Game of Thrones. You watched Game of Thrones as well. Yep, I did. You know, so it's like, uh, um, I don't see that as, I didn't see it as a negative. It, you went in aware of that as well. It's like, not like you missed this amazing, crazy fight scene that would have completely changed your opinion. You saw that one oh. as well. And I saw that opinion and I stand by my opinion because yeah. that the way that's like okay hard oh, home, I, I love it too I love the scene as well hard, hard home was cool as freaking cool as hard home was in seeing the white walkers and everything the fight at the end with will and Hannibal and dollar High, that was just masterful that was that just transcended oh, yeah, yeah. Being it was beautiful a, yeah it was beautiful it was beautiful 
Uh, that was a tough choice. But the fact that you had already picked Hard Home for your pick made the choice easy for me because I'm like, okay, well, Tyson's got that covered. I can go in the opposite <laughs> direction. <laughs> so that takes us through our, our best show picks. If you have not watched Hannibal yet, the first two seasons are already available on Amazon Prime. The third season will be soon. If you have Amazon Prime and you've heard of Hannibal but been like, eh, you know, I like Sons of Lamb and it's not like it's going to top Anthony Hopkins and well you're wrong. Uh, Hannibal completely topples any movie adaption that's been done of it. It is an absolute masterpiece of television. Yes it was on NBC. No you will never think it was on NBC if you watch the show. <laughs> you're going to be thinking at the very worst you're going to be like oh this must have been on FX. Yeah. But more yeah, likely yeah. you're going to be like oh wasn't this on HBO because it has that quality level. It gets away with so much that you just are um, stunned that they were able to get away with on network TV. Um, actually, we, we'd mentioned there was a kaleidoscopic lesbian sex scene. Uh, <laughs> I talked to Brian Fuller, the showrunner of Hannibal at Comic-Con last year, and he said he actually um, got a letter from Standards and Practices congratulating him for being able to slip that path. <laughs> because it was so, like, they said, like, oh, we can't say anything about it. It works, you know, like he, yeah. he covered all the bases yet somehow it's like so much worse than anything they could have, <laughs> you know, have, if they yeah. had showed it graphically, it wouldn't have, it would have been not even it as would, bad, you know, yeah, but it would have actually been more tame if they showed it graphically. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of, yeah, it, it's, it's a show that will amaze you if you take it into context that it's in that and it'll stun you anyways, even if you don't know that it's an NBC show, even if you do assume it's just an HBO show, just artistically the show is going to blow your mind. It's so amazingly done. Um, so amazingly done, yes. So, uh, we're going to talk about some notable moments uh, from 2015. We have one topic we're going to be talking about, but in a, after that, we're also going to be talking about some of the shows that ended and some of the shows that debuted in the year. So let's start off first with our topic, which is rate. So, not exactly a fun topic, but I just thought it would be cool to address how rape had a presence in TV in 2015, most notably on Game of Thrones, Game in of which Thrones, people just yeah. went insane. Game of uh, Thrones really brought that topic to the forefront of conversation this year. Um, a lot of people condemning the show, condemning Game of Thrones. You know, I had come across somebody on the internet who who absolutely thought you were a Cretan if you watched Game of Thrones because of that scene. Yeah, and it's like, it very polarizing. Um. Yeah what it brought to discussion and polarizing. I don't mean that like there were pro rape and anti rape, but polarizing in that some people thought the decision to use it on the show was like a horrible choice. And some people thought, while it was a horrible event, it fit within the characters motivations and the kind of characters there were that it made sense to the plot. You know, it made sense. Um, to the plot. I, I fall put, in line on that side. I uh, put that I, as my most shocking scene on my list. Yeah. Because that that definitely that definitely fits the bill. Uh, it it shock, It seems to have shocked everybody. Um. And yeah, it, it it was the kind of thing that just made headlines. Yeah, and and it's it's um like I said, I wrote an article addressing it myself, in which I was saying that my my viewpoint was basically um it made sense from the perspective of the characters. I think it was not gratuitous in the way a lot of people said they kind of cut away. You didn't see anything really happening. It was suggested, which made it almost worse because you really got the emotional damage of it more than anything else. Um, but I, I felt it was it it was a it was a good plot development for the story. They took a character. This was a scene that was going to happen to a different character, and this is part of what outraged people is that they they basically took this other character out of the picture and replaced her with this character that's a larger character. I think this is like an inevitability that you're going to have this kind of stuff happen on Game of Thrones, which has like hundreds of characters already, you know. Right. And then you take the number of characters 
characters cut from the books and it just doubles and triples from there. It's going to happen. They're not going to be able to make you as as connected to another character in Sansa's place. Like so Sansa seems like the logical choice for this to happen to. Some people felt that it robbed Sansa of her agency as a character as and as a woman. I do not think that was the case. I think this is this takes place in a fantasy world. So of course I can't say back then because it's not a real world, but it takes place in a fantasy world that's like the Middle Ages and it's a, a fantasy world in a time of war. And this happened, you know, like in our world in a time of medieval war, this stuff happened. And to like ignore it, I think is the bigger crime. To say like, oh, you know, let's just pretend that never happened is dismissive and, and very kind of... When characters bad. run around and do all manner of horrible things, mm-hmm. um, you know, I mean, to make an exception, to, to pretend that like they didn't do this particular horrible activity is kind of disingenuous, you know? Yeah. We have characters, but they're, they're so evil that they're willing to do everything, but, you know, not go there. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's just that people are scared of the idea of rape as a plot device right like you shouldn't take this horrible thing and make it a plot device and my answer to that is like how many times how many you know stunning you know award-winning movies involve child molestation murder you know (laughs) it's like nothing is sacred as far as like fiction fiction is a reflection of reality even when it's fantasy even when it's you know it has to reflect the best and worst of what we have in the real world and rape is a real thing and I think they're a, they address the emotions of it properly, and I think it makes sense. It's not like they had a likable character and tried to explain away him doing this. This is like the most detestable character on the show, and he's even right. more hated now. Yeah, he's a, yeah, exactly. This was a detestable character before. He's more hated now. Um, it, I don't think anything about the scene was gratuitous. Um, you know, they it wasn't done just for fun or just yeah. because just because somebody said let's let's have somebody get raped um you know i don't i don't think that was the thinking going into it i think you know this was definitely story driven and uh, you know and i i i i just think you know there were good intentions behind it you know them doing this um you know and and i think you know story-wise i think you know it's there's going to be a payoff Mm -hmm. um i so i don't believe that this was anything gratuitous done just to be shocking or just to have you know ratings or the headlines that came out of it but it did get those headlines yeah. <laughs> um so what we're going to be talking about in rape isn't just with that because there were a few other kind of notable instances of rape on television including in a similar show uh, um called a uh, 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 outlander in which a male character was raped um the outrage didn't get stirred up nearly as much a similar case of a very vile character doing it um similar case in which it had less to do with sex and and like the want of sex and more as like a display of power and punishment onto another person. Um, but it didn't get a lot of attention. But most notably, uh, later in the year, we got Jessica Jones, which the entire story of Jessica Jones is basically a rape survival story. Yeah. It's basically the story of somebody who was raped, um, both literally and figuratively, like mind rape in a yeah. way, and other people that were mind raped. And there's like, you know, there's an allusion to that as well, besides yeah. the physical aspect they of those people hold. in a support group dealing with the fact that they yeah. were mind rape. Um, the they really go in there. Allegory. The whole show is an allegory for rape. Uh, the villain Kilgrave is portrayed as 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 your typical rapist, you know, like like you, you know, he, he doesn't admit he did anything wrong. She wanted it in the first place. Um, you, you know, you, you hear like his reasoning and you know, it, it's... Yeah, she was having a good time because he ordered her to have a good time. Yeah. And he has the mental power to... Yeah, he has the mental power, you know. And, and, and so, you know, that that that's the entire show right there. And it de- so it takes that subject and, and it tackles it head on. And when Jessica Jones was announced, I knew that the, co- the core of the story was, you know, that's what had happened to that character. And I was wondering, since Marvel, you know, uh, 
yeah. When you think of Marvel, you think of the Avengers and stuff. PG thirteen. <laughs> you, you, you don't think of rape. Yeah. <laughs> you know when you think of Marvel. So I I was wondering how like they were going to tackle that and if they were going to shy away from it or try to change her origin a little bit to where like that didn't exactly happen. But the whole show ended up being about that and being an allegory for that. So they they wholly embraced it and I thought that was very brave for Marvel to do. And it, and it makes a great counterpoint to what happened in Game of Thrones. Yeah. And it makes me really happy that they happen to come out in the same year. It does. It makes because me happy. I think, you know, Game of Thrones raised the discussion and Jessica Jones kind of answered it. And Jessica Jones, you know, like people complain, you know, Sansa Stark didn't have any agency. Uh, Jessica Jones has all kinds of agency here. Yeah, but through her rape, she didn't. Through her rape, she didn't. Yeah. But afterwards, you know, you yeah. you just see like you you just see you just see how strong and resilient she is. Mm-hmm. And uh, and you know, I, I, I think it, it took the subject and it, it it tackled it, you know, with grace and uh yeah, it was it was great. So what we're saying here in the end is two thousand fifteen, the year of right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's it's interesting that this became the kind of hot button issue of two thousand fifteen. And, you know, it seems like every year we get something kind of like this. I don't know if I've ever seen it become like this big of a thing, like specifically, you know, usually like if you analyze the trends enough, you can go like, oh, yeah, I can see there is a huge kind of like racial injustice undertone going out throughout TV as a whole this year. 2015, so much about rape. And I don't mean that in like a bad way as in like, you know, it was exploitive of rape. I mean, so many things tackled rape in so many different ways. And Jessica Jones being the cap at the end is beautiful. Yeah. It's the best way to cap that off. Um, it's like a cosmic coincidence that's just perfectly landed uh, in place. And yeah, we started with Sansa in April and we ended with Jessica in uh, November. So uh, that was the year of rape and how it came up in our discussion. So as much as I don't like the kind of real dismissive attitude people had towards Game of Thrones after the rape scene, how people like were condemning the show, I'm glad that it like brought this conversation up because it was a really fascinating conversation that really delves into the way we are as people. Um, so yeah, we'll have to see what 2016 is going to bring up, what it's going to stir up. Uh, we're going to talk now about uh, some of the sad farewells of 2015 so uh some of the shows that ended in in 2015 include justified which was a good show um i'm I'm glad justified ended when it did though i think it was its seventh season it It had run its uh, course and and it was was the fifth season right what it was the fifth season, right? Was it? Well, in anyways, whatever whatever season it was, it had it had pretty much run its course, and it was a planned final season. So they got to kind of address uh, everything six, they wanted to address. It was six seasons, my bad. But yeah, they it was a planned ending. Uh, the showrunner had planned it to end around five or six seasons. Mm-hmm. Um, I said I did not. I justified it was one of my favorite shows. I thought it was one of the most consistently one of the most consistent shows on TV. Um, I don't know like how popular it was. Um, I didn't hear much discussion on that, but it was consistently one of my favorite shows on TV. I loved the characters. I loved the the main character Raylan Givens. I loved uh, Boyd Crowder as as the counterpoint to him, and I loved that mm-hmm. the show seemed to be initially the show was just about Raylan, but then you know they they kind of made it like a twin twin focus where it was simultaneously about Raylan and Boyd and them being on both sides of law and so just it, the area itself and just the area itself so so it, as as a police show it it, it it was really unique it had a unique flavor to it um i don't think there was anything quite like that on tv i haven't seen the last season um i still have to get around to watching that uh, i lost my cable right mm-hmm. before the last season aired so i didn't get a chance um i'm hoping it's good because i was supposed to be the final showdown between raylan and boyd 
grade that the entire series had been building up to. Um, but yeah, one of my one of my favorite shows. Uh, sad to see it go, but at least it went out on its own terms. Yeah, it was uh, it was a good show. I'm glad it went out on its own terms. I'm glad it ended just because I would not have wanted to see the show just start milking itself. Right, you know? right. And so it, it went out the right time. And yeah, it was a good good ending. Another show in a similar situation, Mad Men came to an end. This was a huge thing. This was like AMC's first like mega hit, you know, show that that kind of put them on the map. Of course, now AMC's got you know The Walking Dead, <laughs> like biggest show on TV. But you know, the, the their their first kind of real foray and original programming was Mad Men. Um, it was a very good show. I think it had rough seasons here and there. You know, a lot a lot of people kind of look look back on it now when it was in its final season and we're like, oh, it's such a great show, marvelous writing. I'm like, it had its down. There were a few weak seasons here and there. The show went too long. Um, but I do like the way it ended. Um, I do like the kind of stuff they addressed towards the end. I did like the, the kind of change the show had taken overall, which was really interesting with the setting. Because when the show started, it was like the late 50s, I believe. And so just like the way everything looked and the kind of presence of things. And when the show ended, it was in, I believe, the early 70s. And so you kind of started getting, you know, to these like, you know, the all the suits were like brown and checkered and, you know... <laughs> People had longer hair and sideburns and, you know, it's just like you could see this, the, the culture shock of the 60s and what it had on everything in the world and, and how that related to that kind of path that Mad Men took. So, um, yeah, it's like Justified in the sense it needed to end. It was, it, unlike Justified, Mad Men was already kind of milking itself. Um, so it got to the point, it had, it had a good finale, it ended on its own terms and Mad Men's gone. So, yeah. Uh, Next up was a favorite of Cat uh, and I, which was uh, Parks and Recreation. Um, great comedy series. Another series, you know, third series ended on its own terms. Knew it was going to end. Kind of took its t- took its effort, and at the end of its last season, it kind of set up something a little bit grander and a way to end it. This had perhaps the best ending, like since um, uh, uh, like the way things were brought to conclusion since like Six Feet Under, in that you kind of got the entire stories of like every character on the show like you got flash flash forwards to when they were like 80 or something you know you saw some of them like people at their funerals for some of the characters and you got to kind of see like what exactly happened to all of these characters how they developed what were their adventures where things so like you left the show feeling all kind of warm and fuzzy and knowing like the whole story of these characters like nothing left out so that was kind of exciting um i really liked it i think it was the best season of the show was the final season really really got me so i loved that will you you have not seen parks and rec right are you seen not, just the first season I've just the first season yeah yeah so it's final season was really good i believe that's all up on netflix now the whole show um and our last farewell which was uh will and i both picked for our best show uh hannibal unlike the other uh the other three in this list hannibal did not end on its own terms and yet somehow did like it <laughs> had a really good finale and it felt like a good series finale if you just ignored the very final scene the post credit scene which yeah. was the setup for the next season right. I, I felt like ignoring the very final scene I felt I felt the scene before the post credit scene was like the just the perfect ending for the series uh, Hannibal and Will after so much uh, tension throughout the entire series after everything they've been through together they finally hooked up. Yeah, they finally hook up. They they <laughs> yeah, they finally hook up. Uh we get willable and <laughs> Um, but they embrace and then they go off the cliff together and it that to me that's just perfect that's just the culmination of everything and it made so much sense for both of the characters for Hannibal to be at his moment of weakness when he thought he'd finally won he finally turned Will into a killer Will had finally embraced the fact that he enjoyed it yes Um, and so 
like in that moment he was at his weakness and then will it was perfectly made sense for him to he he wasn't faking that he liked you know it, he did but then at the same time he realized this is bad if this goes on i'm going to become as bad as hannibal yeah and I mean, the world should not have us and so he takes him off the cliff and then you see kind of like hannibal's reaction to that as he's falling isn't like shock or dismay it's it's kind of like a sudden realization like oh of course this is what he did yeah oh, of course this is what he did and yeah it was just brilliant um the way everything was put together yeah um love that show again amazon prime if you have not watched hannibal watch hannibal it was the best show on tv uh up until its cancellation so amazing tv so sad it's gone so looking forward to american gods yeah um, anything brian fuller works on you know he already had my attention from this point on he's like you know i see his name attached it's instant watch it could be the most horrible premise that i have no interest in at all and if his name's attached i'm watching it saint satan solving crimes with a hot female detective <laughs> in, in i'm LA still gonna watch it yeah brian fuller <laughs> 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 it's Oddly Brian. enough, you know, they, they did kind of have a will they won't they relationship with Will and Hannibal. <laughs> they did. There was a yeah. Oddly enough, they did they did do that. Um. <laughs> so uh aside from the sadness, we just finished talking about rape and all these shows that we loved ending. Um, there are a lot of shows that debuted this year that were great, and that's kind of what we wanted to end on. So we're gonna talk about we're just gonna go over, we're not gonna have a large discussion of them, but we're gonna go over some of the amazing shows that debuted this year. Uh, Mr. Robot, amazing. It's basically Fight Club the series with hackers. <laughs> so good. Almost universally loved by everybody who's seen it. It's just so, so good. Um, the Expanse, absolutely killing it, especially after the fourth episode, which is, yeah, you've seen that. So there's an event that happens in the fourth episode that really cements this as like, this is the best science fiction in the year. Uh, so good. Uh, still on right now at season finale is a two-part episode that airs um next week uh agent carter so marvel you know getting big into tv this year this is the first marvel one we're talking about yep. um, uh, jessica jones and daredevil both yeah all three year. so good but agent carter was first agent. And that was the one we were kind of like hotly anticipating at the same time we we're kind of like oh i don't know because you know agents of shield just came off a really good mid-season finale and then we watched Agent Carter and we were like oh yeah this is good <laughs> this is the direct continuation of uh, um, Captain America the first Avenger so it, it's, it just feels like it picks up right after that and it just continues logically on from there following Peggy Carter handles issues of like you know gender inequality in a brilliant way beautifully shot has just this look to it that's amazing but yeah great show great chemistry between all the actors and characters um you already mentioned daredevil and jessica jones as well we talked about them quite a bit in this both debut that's three marvel shows man three marvel shows in 2015 new ones uh and we're gonna get even more next year it's crazy um uh, or this year i should say <laughs> man seeking woman our show we talked about quite a bit today uh um will quickly took a liking to this show still isn't able to see the second season so he's gonna be <laughs> talking about that for in in, in our 2000 2016 talk <laughs> when he's yeah. caught up with that um but yeah uh Mansi Kimun, really good comedy really unique way of uh telling a story crazy ex-girlfriend this is another one of will's favorites this, uh, i've only seen the first episode i was pissed off I, I went on to hulu to watch the rest and now it's like they only have the fourth episode on <laughs> yeah cw is really bad about that with that yeah. so i'm like oh i guess i'm waiting until it's on netflix or hulu again or whatever it ends up coming to but not gonna see it now i'm kind of disappointed at that because it was a really good first episode will i know you loved it you you picked it for a few uh i think two of the your picks for this year um yes i did uh best new show and best protagonist yeah um yeah it yeah. is a good show it's it watch it people come yeah. on it, it needs the ratings um another kind of like weird kind of over the top show that debuted around the same time uh is scream queens yes <laughs> 
what you and I loved and we're laughing about when we talk about the just ridiculous events. I still remember us talking about like the first two episodes that aired like back to back and how we were kind of like unsure of what the tone of the show was because sometimes it was more parody and sometimes it was less. By the third episode, we knew exactly what it was. Yeah, by the third, yeah. You knew exactly where it stood by the third episode. <laughs> and it was glorious. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so yeah, just so over the top. The writing was sharp and fast. This came flying at you and so cutting. Uh, um, Emma Roberts in her role, amazing. Emma Roberts uh, was one of the standout roles. I think if we had the best characters of 2015 uh, category, uh, her character definitely would have would have won that category. Yeah, uh, she was a, she was a standout character, definitely amazing. Uh, I ended up picking for funniest scene. I picked uh, the Backstreets Back scene from yes. uh, Scream Queens. <laughs> That, that that is a perfect that is a perfect choice for that <laughs> uh so yeah scream queens great show hilarious um better call saul that was 2000 that almost feels like it was a 2014 to me oh my god no, that came out in 2015 started at the beginning of 2015 this I, is another one that like i didn't nominate for any categories I, and i'm kind of like oh why didn't i did i was it not fair it's like no it was it was close on almost every category and I, I just want to say that it, with with best of end of year list, it's easy to forget the stuff that came early in the year. Yeah. Um, so these or for it to have as much of an impact on you. Yeah. These so these kinds of lists when they come out at the end of the year is almost entirely one sided to stuff that came out in the latter half of the year. That's more immediate uh, than stuff. That's when it's still like yeah, it's still swimming around in your head. And yeah. But better call Saul was an amazing show. I did consider it for for most of the awards that I had there. It's just that other ones ended up coming out ahead for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would not have faulted anybody choosing anything from that show. It was great. Um, I, you know, a lot of people kind of go like, oh, I think it was better than Breaking Bad or off the bat. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I still think I like Breaking Bad more, but I uh, Better Call Saul anybody. was very good. I haven't heard anybody talk about Better Call Saul with the same reverence they reserved for Breaking Bad yet. So I have heard some people say like right out, out of the gate that it was better. Right. Not necessarily that it's better than Breaking Bad at its best, that it like for its first season it was better. Um which, you know, it's arguable. I, I disagree on that front, but still, I mean, that's in no way diminishes the show. Breaking Bad was amazing. <laughs> One of the best shows of all time, you know, so it's you can't that doesn't take anything away from Better Call Saul saying I don't think it was as good as Breaking Bad. Um the last Last Man on Earth. Really good comedy series. Now in its its second season. Oh, God. So funny. Such an interesting premise with, you know, like the world's over and it's just really over the top ridiculous. In its second season, which did air, part of it did air in 2015, including the episode I'm talking about, it had an absolutely hilarious gestural presence uh, um, by, uh, God, I can't even think of his name. Will Ferrell had, yeah. had an amazing, like, cameo appearance and and his character had an effect beyond that appearance um great uh great show uh unbreakable kimmy schmidt what did you think of that um, I loved it. Yeah, it's great. I, a lot of people didn't like it. I think the kind of this is a, it's an it's another one of those shows. It's like it's great because it there's like no cynicism in the show. Right, I love that. Uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt was a strong contender for my best comedy. I yeah. think Man Seeking Woman just edged it out for me, mm-hmm. but that would have probably made it had Man Seeking Woman not happened. Um, yeah, very great, uncynical show. Um, you know kind of cartoonish similar to like man seeking woman in that way that like they're almost cartoonish like their laws of physics in the world are kind of off you know right right um and uh yeah very bright very fun show very quick-witted um great pickup by netflix originally supposed to be an nbc series uh sense eight uh now you just saw the one episode of that that we did for advocates right yeah so sense eight is something i really dug that was a very polarizing show some people hated it some people loved it 
Um, I saw a lot of people that I really respect the opinions of and saw them go like, yeah, this sucks. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, really? You know, and, and I really dug it. Um, very ambitious, if nothing else. I think even people that didn't like it can agree that it was an incredibly ambitious show. And that's good for television in general. Um, another Netflix series, Narcos. Uh, Netflix killing it in 2015, man. Lots of shows. Uh, Narcos was another one. Really good show about Pablo Escobar. Uh, it seemed to get a lot of hatred in Colombia, <laughs> where people were nitpicking the accents and stuff, I guess. But um, for people who don't live in Colombia and don't care about regional accents, uh, most of them seem to love it. So uh, yeah, Narcos, very good. Uh, Master of None, another Netflix series. Uh, we've mentioned it here as well. Uh, Ed picked it as his best comedy. Uh, Ash versus Evil Dead. Oh, we have Ash versus this, Evil Dead. This is one that I am amazed did not make my list oh and my it isn't God. because it's not good or anything there are lots of places where i considered it it's just i don't know it's not Ash vs. Evil Dead is not an, like an event show. It's not like a show that like you go like, oh my god, I can't wait to see this next episode. It's it's like, it doesn't have that feeling. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, I think that it's perfect in that regard. I never wasn't smiling when I watched Ash vs. Evil Dead. From beginning to end, every episode, I was smiling. I thoroughly enjoyed every episode. And it was nice and relaxing to watch that after watching so many like heavy dramas and stuff. You watch these heavy dramas and you turn on Ash vs. Evil Dead and you see Bruce Campbell playing the dick Ash, <laughs> you know, cutting people up with a chainsaw and delivering one-liners. It was great, you know, so cathartic, so perfectly placed. Just somehow did not hit with the, our category here, right? So yeah, that's uh, Ash versus Evil Dead. That's the last of the shows we had on our list of debuts this year. But man, what a list! Just to go over really quickly again: Mr. Robot, The Expanse, Agent Carter, Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Man Seeking Woman, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Scream Queens, Better. Call Saul, The Last Man on Earth, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, Sensei, Narcos, Ash vs. Evil Dead, Master of None. All of those came out in 2015. So when you look back and you think like, man, it sucks that we lost Justified, Mad Men, Parks and Rec, and Hannibal, just look at that list. And that's a short list. I, I left a lot of shows off of that list that we could have talked about as well and just focused on kind of the bigger one. Um, but that brings this segment to an end. Uh, we'll briefly talk about what's coming up next week which there isn't much to talk about. American Crime Story, the O.J. Simpson uh, season. You've heard of this, right? Mm-hmm, I've heard of this. The People yeah. versus O.J. Simpson starring uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. and um, uh, John Travolta, amongst others, <laughs> uh, is coming to FX on February 2nd. On that same day is the mid-season returns for The Muppet and Fresh Off the Boat. Uh, and that's all we have coming up next week, really. So uh, that's a interest uh, to our demographic at least <laughs> um so yeah it's slowing down the the winter season is slowing down we're in getting towards february a lot less is coming out in february um but that means we're also approaching the the fall season or not the fall season the spring season which is when we're going to get stuff like game of thrones um so there's a lot to be looking forward to there even though it's slowing down a little bit it also means that we have a ton of stuff on tv right now we already have the experience Expanse is already airing. The Magicians is already airing. You know, we already have all of our comic book shows back pretty much, you know? Uh, so yeah, that's, that's what's to look forward to next week. Thank you everybody for listening. This is TVEnthusiast.com's official podcast, The Weekly Set. You can check out our main website at TVEnthusiast.com and check out all of our content. You can check out our picks for 2015 that we briefly went over in this, or not, not so briefly went over in this podcast. Uh, you can also check out, uh, any other featured content we have including uh, I mentioned uh, the magicians and how I did a conference call that's up on our front page as well we also have a comic book show that we record every Sunday it goes up on Mondays uh, that show is called TVE versus Marvel and DC and that is hosted by my guest on the show today Will Hello. Uh, that's it so yeah check out all of that content uh, and stay listening to the weekly set bye bye if you would like to voice your opinion and send an email to the weekly set at tventhusiast.com. TV Enthusiast is a part of the Enthusiast Media Network. Stay tuned to TV Enthusiast and the Weekly Set Podcast for more coverage of all.